Hello, I'm Miss Ginsburg with No Adam, and today we're going to be reading Earth and Human Activity. This is a student reader in Unit 3. Water on Earth, the Ogallala Aquifer. Underneath eight states in the Western United States is a massive system of groundwater. It holds so much fresh water that if all of its water were pumped out, it would cover all 50 states with, one, uh, with 0.5 meters or 1.5 feet of water. Groundwater is the supply of fresh water found beneath Earth's surface in the pores of soil, sand, and rock. This groundwater system is called the Ogallala Aquifer or the High Plains Aquifer. An aquifer is the underground layer of rock, sand, or soil that holds groundwater. The Ogallala Aquifer is the largest aquifer in North America. Filtration. Groundwater isn't an underground river. Instead, it is water that fills the spaces between soil particles and rock. Because of this, it is some of the cleanest water on Earth. This is because the particles of rock that make up aquifers act as a natural filter as water moves through the layers of material. Picture a coffee pot. Hot water is poured into the pot where it mixes with ground coffee grounds. A coffee filter then traps the coffee grounds and allows liquid coffee to flow through. Coffee filters work because they have pores that are large enough for water to travel through, but small enough that coffee grounds cannot. Aquifers work in the same way as coffee filters. As gravity pulls water from Earth's surface underground, the water is filtered, becoming purer. Some aquifers have cleaner water than other aquifers because they are better able to filter out contaminants as water moves through them. Earth systems. Groundwater is the result of two interacting Earth systems. A system is a set of connected, interacting parts that form a more complex whole. Scientists study Earth's systems to understand how the different parts interact with and influence one another. The hydrosphere is the system made up of all of the water found on Earth. The geosphere is made up of Earth's landforms, including rocks and soil. As water moves over Earth's surface, it shapes the geosphere. It does this by weathering and eroding the rocks and soil it passes over. The hydrosphere is also affected by the geosphere because not all rocks store water. The processes that shape and reform rocks in the rock cycle determine how likely a rock is to store water. How does water get underground? Rocks that are both porous and permeable are most likely to hold water. Porosity refers to the number of spaces between particles in a substance. It determines how much water a material can hold. Permeability refers to the ease with which substances such as water move through a material. It determines whether water can move through the material. Some of the water in the Ogallala Aquifer has been stored there for millions of years. It got there when water on Earth's surface seeped into the ground. Amounts of water on Earth. The Ogallala Aquifer is one place where fresh water is stored on Earth. Almost 75% of the planet is covered in water. Most of this water is found in oceans as salt water. Only a small amount of water on Earth is fresh water. Most fresh water is stored in frozen glaciers or underground in aquifers. Some fresh water is found in rivers and lakes. There is a set amount of water on Earth. Just like all matter, water is never created or destroyed. Instead, it moves from one form to another. The water cycle. With enough heat from the sun, liquid water on Earth's surface evaporates into the atmosphere. Evaporation is the process of liquid water changing into water vapor, its gas state. As the water vapor moves higher in the atmosphere, it loses heat. Eventually, it will condense. 
When it condenses, it changes from a gas back into liquid water. Precipitation is water falling back to Earth's surface in the form of rain, snow, sleet, or hail. Gravity's downward pull causes precipitation to fall back to the surface. Some water that doesn't immediately evaporate back into the atmosphere will collect into lakes, pools, and other water sources. Some water that falls to Earth's surface will flow downhill because of gravity. Any area of land where all of the water that falls in it drains into a common outlet is called a watershed. Still, more water is used by the biosphere because all living things need water to survive. Plants absorb precipitation through their roots. They release water back to the atmosphere through their leaves as water vapor. The process by which water moves through plants from roots to their leaves is called transpiration. If the plant's roots are deep enough, it can also access groundwater. The circulation of water through the hydrosphere from Earth's surface to the atmosphere and back is called the water cycle. The water cycle is complex. It processes very amount around the Earth, around the planet. For example, very deep groundwater can take more than a million years to complete the water cycle and return to the ocean. In contrast, in hot climates and seasons, precipitation sometimes evaporates just seconds after it falls to Earth's surface. Water and weather. As water moves around the planet through the water cycle, it is not distributed evenly. Some regions around the planet receive a lot of rainfall throughout the year. Other regions receive very little rainfall. The amount of precipitation is one part of weather. Weather refers to the conditions of the atmosphere in a particular place at a particular time. Weather conditions include temperature, humidity, wind, speed, air pressure, and precipitation. Climate is the average weather over a span of 30 years. In other words, weather changes hour to hour while climate changes over very long periods of time. The high plains where the Ogallala Aquifer is located have a semi-arid climate. This means they receive little rain throughout the year, less than 50 centimeters of rain per year. The high plains region is also known for strong winds and extreme temperature changes. The temperature can change by negative one degree Celsius or 30 degrees Fahrenheit from day to night. Nebraska is one state in the high plains. It sits over the deepest part of the Ogallala Aquifer. Its capital is Lincoln. In the winter, Lincoln's temperature can reach negative 10 degrees Celsius or 13 degrees Fahrenheit. In the summer, it can reach 32 degrees Celsius or 89 degrees Fahrenheit. The most common form of precipitation in Lincoln are rain in the summer and light snow in the winter. Winter and summer are two seasons. A season is a time of year that has specific weather patterns and amounts of daylight. Each season has similar patterns of weather in specific locations. Farming with groundwater. Because the high plains do not receive a lot of rain, they are not naturally fertile places for plants. However, the water in the Ogallala Aquifer has turned the high plains region from dry, windswept plains to one of the country's most fertile regions. Despite the lack of rain, the High Plains region is called America's breadbasket. This is because it grows so many crops that feed the rest of the country. These crops include corn, sorghum, soybeans, wheat, and cotton. All of these crops need water to grow. Because there is little rain, farmers depend on water from the Ogallala Aquifer. People who live nearby also use the groundwater for drinking. When too much groundwater is removed from an aquifer, it can upset the natural balance of the water cycle. Aquifers are naturally balanced when the amount of water being added to the aquifer from precipitation is roughly the same as the amount of water leaving the aquifer. The majority of the water in the Ogallala aquifer has been there for millions of years. However, 
the Ogallala Aquifer is currently being removed faster than it can be added. This worries many people because it is the most important source of fresh water in this region. Urban flooding, flooding in Chicago. The city of Chicago, Illinois has 3,057 kilometers or 1,900 miles of public alleys. Years ago, city planners decided to pave the alleys with regular concrete or asphalt. However, concrete and asphalt are both impermeable. This means that water cannot absorb into them. Instead, the water remains on the surface. This creates several challenges. During heavy rains, flooding can occur. Flooding happens when water overflows onto land that is normally dry. In urban areas such as Chicago, the water also often becomes polluted. Finally, less water can absorb into the ground. As a result, aquifers cannot be replenished. Engineers solve problems. Engineers in Chicago decided to come up with the solutions to reduce the amount of flooding during a big storm. Engineering is different from science, although science and engineering are connected. Scientists use experiments to gain knowledge. Engineers use that scientific knowledge and mathematics to solve a problem by creating new technologies. Similar to how scientists follow a scientific process to answer a question, engineers also follow a process. Engineers often follow eight steps to guide them as they create new technologies to solve problems. The engineering process begins with a problem. In Chicago, the problem was flooding that occurred when heavy rains fell on impermeable surfaces in the city. That flooding turned into storm water runoff that was often polluted. When engineers are defining a problem, they include the criteria. The criteria are the needs the solution must meet. They also include the constraints. Constraints are ways the solution is limited. Once they have identified the problem, engineers need to research the problem to find out what is known about the problem. For example, engineers need to know that permeable materials allow water to flow through them easily. They also need to know that some materials filter water better than other materials. After engineers have researched their problem, they survey the available materials. This survey includes a sketch of the material as well as how much of the material they have available and the properties of that material. For example, the Chicago engineers needed to think about the porosity and permeability of the materials they were planning to use. Engineers then come up with possible solutions for how the problem can be solved with the available materials. Possible solutions to flooding include designing permeable materials that can be used instead of impermeable concrete. The next step is to diagram and build a prototype. A prototype is a scaled down first draft of a technology. Once built, engineers test the prototype. They use the test to gather data. Data are measurements and observations that capture how well the prototype solves the problem during testing. Engineers test their permeable material to see how much water it absorbs. Finally, engineers use their data to decide whether to refine or replicate. The data tell engineers whether their prototype technology solved the problem. Following an engineering process. Problem. Identify the problem, including the criteria and constraints of the problem, and summarize in two or three sentences. Research. Use what you know to help solve the problem. Record a minimum of three facts relevant to the problem. Survey available materials. List the available materials that can be used to solve the problem and include for each material a sketch, quantity, description, and properties. Possible solutions. List three ways the problem can be solved with the available materials. Diagram and build prototype. Draw a hand-sized scientific diagram of the prototype solution you will then build from your materials. A scaled down version of a technology is called a prototype. Title the diagram and include labels for each material or part of your prototype. 
test. Test your prototype to see how well it solves the problem. Data. Collect data, measurements, and observations to reveal how well the prototype solves the problem. Refine or replicate. Use your data to evaluate the success of the prototype and recommend if it should be refined or replicated. You may redesign your prototype to better solve the problem. Every conclusion must contain a minimum of three elements. One, restate the problem and describe the prototype technology. Two, make a claim about whether the technology should be refined or replicated. Three, use key points of data gathered from testing to support the recommendation to refine or replicate. Dams and salmon, migrating salmon. The Chinook salmon travel thousands of miles over their lifetime. They are born in fresh water at the mouth of the Columbia River. When they are old enough, they swim downstream until they reach the Pacific Ocean. There, they grow into adults. Adult salmon can reach 18 kilograms or 40 pounds. As adults, salmon will swim upstream. They follow the same path, but in the opposite direction to arrive at the same fresh water where they were born to lay their own eggs. This location is called their spawning grounds. A dangerous journey. The journey of the Chinook salmon is dangerous. When the fish first come out of their eggs, they are tiny, barely an inch long. They remain in their stream for about a year as they grow larger. Many animals hunt the salmon for food in the stream and as they begin their migration down the river. The salmon can become meals for larger fish, birds, and land animals such as bears. The salmon that survive the journey to the ocean grow large there. Then they must begin their journey back, swimming upstream against the current. They face predators on this journey as well. A predator is an animal that eats other animals. Animals that get eaten by other animals are called prey. Damming the river. Another danger facing the salmon is that people have changed the natural flow of the river. This is done with dams. A dam is a special kind of wall that holds back water. Dams slow down the flow of a stream or river. Because of this, people use dams to control flooding. They also cause water to pool behind them. This creates a new pond or lake called a reservoir. How dams help people. People also use dams for electricity. Most of the electricity in the Northwest United States comes from dams on the rivers. Electricity that comes from moving water is called hydroelectric power. Hydroelectric power is a renewable energy source because it can be replenished in a short period of time. Remember that moving water has kinetic energy. In a dam, that moving water turns turbines. Those turbines then turn a metal shaft in an electric generator, which is a motor that produces electricity. People use electricity to power lights, electronics, and other appliances. Protecting salmon. When fish reach the reservoir of a dam, the river current stops. Without the flow of water, the fish become confused because they lose their sense of direction. Dams can also be deadly. If a fish is swept into the turning blades of a turbine, it can be killed. Many commercial fishermen value Chinook salmon. Because of this, they want to help protect the fish. So engineers have designed different technologies to protect the salmon. Most of these technologies, like fish ladders, help the salmon move past the dam so they can continue their journey to the ocean. Wow, I learned a lot in earth and human activity. I hope you learned a lot too. I'll see you tomorrow with another one. Bye.